What's up, Ego Hackers? Welcome back. It is our live lecture that we do every single um, month. And this is uh, season 18, and I'm told, episode 23. Cognitive Mechanics, where we are discussing uh, today the body temple, which is great. It's pretty awesome to be able to have that opportunity uh, to do that. And uh, yeah, so welcome to the show. Sorry for late, but not sorry. I'm almost always late. So, but I usually start before 8 p.m. Eastern. So, just, yeah, I was always starting within the uh, range between 7.30 and 8 p.m. Eastern. I just remember this little ENFP customer I had who got so mad at me about that. And I just told him to go pound sand and kick rocks because I don't care. So, Gonna go with uh, my comfort, good sir, not your S I inferior, my S I inferior. Good times. So yeah, the body temple. Um, we've been uh, loosely talking about the various uh, temples and what they mean, especially from a, com uh, a cognitive mechanic point of view. Uh, the body temple is probably the most behind the scenes temple uh, out of all of the temples. And uh, is often probably some of the most misunderstood uh, Mostly because, you know, if you look from a king, warrior, magician, lover point of view, you can recognize that each of the four temples are kind of attached to uh, the different archetypes. The heart temple is the is the warrior, uh, for example. And then uh, you also have, uh, um, you know, the body temple. It's, it's king, right? And the king archetype of the mature masculine is all about producing more than you consume. That's that's like the main idea behind the king archetype and, and king energy, uh, especially the king energy that uh, men ultimately need to learn in their life, uh, et cetera, you know, to that point. Apparently, um, apparently my green screen doesn't like the fact that I'm wearing the sweatshirt today, but uh, it is what it is. So yeah, uh, the body temple is pretty well misunderstood and I think it's kind of misrepresented. Um, yeah, the body temple has the most obesity in it out of all of the 16 types, which is kind of interesting because it has the deadly sin of gluttony attached to it. So I guess that makes a lot of sense. But the body temple also, since it's in service of, you know, legacy, ultimately, in service of introverted sensing, as the perception function that it serves, and uh, and then also in service of, um, um, I don't think it's introverted feeling, I think it's extroverted thinking, is the uh, decision-making function that it serves, uh, a rational uh, introverted sensor. So like a, it's basically like an STJ to a point, you know, uh, cosmically, I guess, or metaphysically uh, to that point of view. The body temple still has some insane use. The body temple has an interesting connection to something known as manifest destiny. Does anyone here actually know what manifest destiny actually means? I will define it right now. Uh, but the body temple is ultimately responsible because it is the harbinger of what is known as manifest destiny. Uh, so manifest destiny, a phrase coined in 1845, is the idea that XYZ group is destined by God or to expand its dominion and spread uh, its ideology across uh, a huge frontier, ultimately. That's what manifest destiny is all about. And manifest destiny is ultimately the main outcome or the result uh, that uh, is from the body temple. Sure, you could argue that's legacy, and, which is technically true, but how do they actually get that legacy? And it really comes through this idea of manifest destiny. And where manifest destiny is actually showing right now in terms of humanity, it's the new frontier. You know, for a long time, the, the old frontier used to be known as the new world. And uh, that's ultimately where we live now here in the United States of America. We are in the new world, but it's no longer the new world anymore. The frontier has been conquered, been subdued, every inch of it explored. So it, there is no frontier here basically anymore. 
and uh, fron frontiersmanship or being a you know all about finding that frontier is ultimately what the body temple needs. It's also the main purpose of the body temple because from the body temple we end up getting things like exploration, discovery, uh, purpose for people's lives, everything there, and that's why it's all about manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is purpose and discovery meeting together and uh, becoming uh, a little bit. So, yeah. Because I'm the first transhuman, huh? All right, you guys don't like the sound, huh? I'll turn down the gain. All right, let me know if that's better with the gain turned down. Seems like the light is just terrible right now. Let's see if that works. Let's see if that fixes it. It's mostly because of my uh, uh, white sweatshirt. If I wear darker colors, then uh, the light can be a little bit better. So is the sound better there, guys? Just let me know. Just stuttery at times. Well, give me a little bit more than just that. Let me uh, let's see here. Not really what? What does that mean, color? That's way too direct. Add in more information. Don't be lazy. So, all right, I'll turn down the gain to 75. Let's see if that helps. The Sinister Green Aura. Okay, yeah, I mean, never not have a Sinister Green Aura. I think I'll bring back uh, the Blue Yeti. The problem is, is that with the Blue Yeti, it um, picks up a lot more than just me. That's why I use this microphone, because it's a lot closer. So, but, uh, yeah, I turned down the uh, gain to 75, so that should help. I could turn it down even further if you guys want. So, yeah. Manifest Destiny, basically, discovery plus uh, purpose equals Manifest Destiny, and where is humanity's manifest destiny right now? Well, obviously, it's to get in orbit. It's to live in orbit. It's to live in the solar system. It's Mars, basically. These are the new frontiers that are available to humanity. And eventually, humanity will get so big that every inch of our solar system would also be explored. And then from that point of view, uh, we're going to have to expand beyond our solar system. And then eventually, we'll touch every single inch of our galaxy. And then eventually we're going to have to expand beyond our galaxy, right? And the idea of expanding beyond our galaxy just kind of seems, un it seems unthinkable. It seems really unthinkable right now, especially from a popular culture thing right now. There's only a few, like, for example, stories or television shows out there that talk about exploring beyond our galaxy. One of them was Stargate Atlantis and then recently uh, Star Trek, at least Star Trek Discovery. They had a couple of episodes that took them outside of the galaxy. Not entirely sure how I really liked uh, their approach uh, to that, but at least they're trying to do that. And that's ultimately that's ultimately where these frontiers are. This is why Captain Kirk, Captain Picard, uh, Captain Pike within Star Trek, as created by Gene Roddenberry, a member of the Body Temple because he is an INTP, they start talking about manifest destiny in their opening speech in every single intro. Space, the final frontier, okay? That's literally what it is. It's all about being the frontier. It's about our manifest destiny, our purpose as humanity to expand. Where does that come from? Um, what is the first example of manifest destiny? Um, so I will read it to you right now, stand by, as I get it for you. Uh, so, so it comes from uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, which reads as the following. God blessed Adam and Eve and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. 
So basically, this is God commanding humanity to have the manifest destiny. He is commanding the body temple. He is commanding legacy. He is commanding dominion and subduing of the frontier. The frontier, in this particular case, is the earth. But the frontier on the earth has basically ran out. And now we are looking at the next frontier, which is the frontier in orbit of this planet. And then ultimately the rest of the solar system and the planets beyond, as has been also talked about in uh, John F. Kennedy's speech, supposedly just before we landed on the moon, supposedly. The jury's still out on whether or not we actually landed on the moon or not. Who knows? Uh, maybe maybe Elon Musk might be the first man on the moon after all. Who knows? We'll find out, I guess. So, so with that, uh, the body temple has this huge responsibility to humanity. Having that, being that source, that harbinger of manifest destiny, is ultimately the outcome that allows us to walk the journey of discovery for the sake of our purpose. We are able to draw our purpose as human beings from discovery, the act of discovery, because of our manifest destiny. And this is how humanity ultimately always has a future. The problem is if you take away the concept of a frontier away from humanity, then we don't have a future anymore. We don't have any dreams anymore. I've been uh, checking these out a lot recently, um, these books by uh, Neil Gaiman. And I just did a lecture on uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, series, The Sandman. The name of the lecture is how, uh, how do I as an INFP bring my dreams into reality ultimately? And I talk about Neil Gaiman's character, uh, Morpheus, uh, who is a uh, dream of the endless. He's responsible, he's kind of like an angel. He's responsible for people's dreams, et cetera. That he's the personification of dreams and ultimately an INFP. And he's able to cause dreams to come into reality with his Philosopher's Stone, which is basically a ruby, right? That is his Philosopher's Stone that he's able to actually pull this off and, and do that with. The thing is, is that there's a lesson within the show. It's called The Sandman. It's on Netflix, or you can read those uh, graphic novels uh, if you want. But basically, one of the main points that Morpheus basically states to one of the villains in the story is that if you take away people's dreams, then humanity will ultimately just kill itself. It will self-destruct. Dreams are the source of hope. And the body temple, because of manifest destiny, literally gives human beings hope hope for a better tomorrow you know a better a better experience a better si a better past something to remember it by right now while the heart temple is all about introverted intuition and can passionately push humanity in that direction it's a journey it's not an outcome and i is still a journey whereas introverted sensing is the outcome and the outcome is a better tomorrow. The outcome is the promised land. So the idea of what the promised land, which is also another biblical idea, that idea of the promised land, the promised land itself, the concept, the symbol of what the pro promised land is, that is the body temple. So what that allows is it allows for humanity to grow. Why is that important? There's an example of Elon Musk, who is a member of the Body Temple. He is an INTP, and he has this thing about, you know, hey, you know, we're going to go land on Mars, for example. And people are like, well, are you going to have the same laws here on Earth and on Mars? He's like, hell no. We're going to do whatever we want. And we're since we're the first ones there, it's our laws. You see what I'm saying? A whole new culture will be born. A whole new SI, a whole new tradition will be born. And this is why we have the cycle of renewal, the cycle of rebirth as a result of the temples and the body temple is what completes that cycle. And it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And it all comes from manifest destiny. As Moody McSully would say, when the people are lacking vision, they will perish.
If they have no dreams, there is no future. You cannot take away people's future. You cannot take away their dreams. If you tell a person their future, then they don't have one. Never forget that. So what makes the body a temple? A temple is a religious and sacred concept. For the types within the body temple, legacy and achievement are sacred. But above all, it is action that is valued above the rest. A body temple type that is disengaged and stagnating is likely not happy nor healthy. Physically speaking, the body is the container for all of the temples, physically speaking. Uh, scripturally, the body is even referenced as a temple. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, chapter six verse 19, quote, uh, let's actually read that to you right now, uh, which goes like, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You do not own yourself. So think of the body temples, introverted sensing, plus extroverted thinking being humanity's database storage for all the experiences and accomplishments humans have achieved. It's like the container for the collective unconscious itself. So introverted sensing, right? It's on axis with extrovert intuition. Okay, so extrovert intuition is the collective unconscious, but NE cannot exist without knowledge of the past, cannot exist without the past, just like the past cannot exist without the potential of NE, the potential of the collective unconscious. That's why introverted sensing is ultimately the container for extrovert intuition. Introverted sensing provides the boundaries and uh, the guide stones, basically, for eventually, under, uh, you know, providing all potential futures and choices available to a human being. Introverted sensing does this. This is why the body temple is the container for the soul. And the soul is the collective unconscious, the collective unconscious of man, the soul temple, extrovert intuition versus the body temple, which is introverted sensing. They're on axis with one another. You see, this is how this works. So body, as defined, is of or relating to the body or relating to the main reading matter of a book, article, etc. Colloquially refer to someone's achievements and portfolio as their body of work. A body of work is literally introverted sensing plus extroverted thinking and is no different from a body of accomplishments. The types within the body temple view the problems of the world as stemming from a lack of action. That's because, folks, again, if the people lack a vision, they will perish. But here's the thing. How, what, what does a person need to take action? They have to have vision. They have to have a dream. They, there has to be an available frontier available to a human being. And if there is no frontier, if there is nothing new under the sun, then all of a sudden humanity will just surrender to nihilism and self-destruct. Ultimately, probably one of King Solomon's biggest flaws in all of his wisdom, yet he himself ended up surrendering to nihilism, which is pretty sad. So the body temple see the purple without a sense of purpose and without a place to explore and build. Just as the soul worships individuality, the heart worships passion, the mind worships knowledge, the body temple worships creation, the act of bringing something into existence, right? not unlike an INFP wishing to make their dreams become a reality. So let's look at it from a macro perspective. The body temple is the collective introverted sensing and expert thinking for humanity, as we've already established. Types in the body temple are looking to experience introverted sensing achievement, uh, experience introverted sensing achievement, expert thinking, but also to take part in building a tradition that continues for generations to come. Now, you guys have always heard me say that tradition is the corpse of wisdom. But there is still value to tradition. And I was actually talking to someone yesterday about this. Uh, I was talking to uh, our good friend, uh, Jay Patel, an INFJ uh, within, the, uh, um, within the community. He's also a mod on the Discord for the Ego Hacker community. Uh, very fantastic fellow. And uh, we, were basically, we were basically talking about how, you know, 
so many cultures are losing their culture. And, he, and you know, he's, in, he's, uh, he's Indian and he's trying to basically save his Indian culture by making sure to participate in his culture whenever he can. He, he loves his culture. But many people out there have lost their culture to Westernization, Americanization. Uh, this is happening to literally everybody across the planet. And for people to be able to, they should be given the right to preserve their culture. You know, everyone thinks that Americanization and Westernization is better, but instead we've lost our, uh, our food traditions from our mothers, which has caused us to become obese. Uh, we've also lost our relationships with our fathers and now we are fatherlessness. We have fatherlessness everywhere and it's destroying our lives. So many people are in jail so many marriages failing, so many children being left without an identity, and it's getting worse. Don't forget, it is written, in the last days, I will send my prophet Elijah to you. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their sons and the hearts of sons to their fathers, or else I will strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And that will be our legacy, utter destruction. What's interesting about the prophet Elijah, if you think about it, is that the prophet Elijah was the most anti-feminist prophet in the Bible. He actually stood up to uh, the father of Jezebel and then also Jezebel herself, who was a false prophetess. And what she did, she brought in her teachings, which was ultimately feminism. It's the first time you see feminism in the Bible. You see it in many other places, especially the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas has an entire section devoted to feminism. And I believe it's also lightly touched on in the Apocalypse of Peter. Okay, These books are very important, especially since they're not part of the typical biblical canon. Because biblical canon was established by the Catholic Church on the issue of salvation alone, but not everything else. Not the issue of character, not the issue of passion, not the issue, uh, you know, of knowledge, the issue of creation and legacy, the issue of the temples, right? This is why I have such a hard time with the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Carthage and the Councils of Trent. I loathe them with a fiery passion. So tradition, tradition ends up being ultimately what's created by the body temple and it's tradition, even though it is the corpse of wisdom, the benefit to wisdom, though, is that it can protect future generations. Now, obviously, sometimes we have to tear some traditions down, or maybe we have to restore certain traditions. But at the end of the day, like traditions still have benefit. And food tradition is a huge example. I'm half German. I didn't start getting healthier until I started eating like a German, because I was eating to support my genes what my genes preferred, and I'm half German. So I was able to eat and get healthier. So I eat a lot of sauerkraut. I eat a lot of bratwurst. I love me some verst. It's very good, you know, very important. So perceptually, the body temple is the feedback for humanity from perception perspective, introverted sensing. What does that mean? It means that we don't fully know whether something is a good idea until it exists. The body temple is the ultimate testing ground for all the potential, the vision, and the knowledge given by the previous temples. The body's temple job then is to become, is to provide the feedback which leads to ultimately the refinement. Are people having a good experience? Are these traditions anything of value? Is this ways of doing things? Are these procedures worth doing? Are these uh, do these rules matter? Like from an extroverted thinking standpoint, Are, do these should these laws still be laws, right? But the body temple is also a TE input for the cycle of judgment functions. What does that mean? It is the spark that articulates the steps to accomplishment. It's uh, it's also it's also like the arbiter of rules and regulations and systems and processes and procedures, right? Body temple is there to be like, again, that testing ground of those rules, procedures, ways of doing things, systems, etc. Okay, does it actually work? What is the actual outcome? What is the actual result? And is that result worth adopting? Is it a tradition that we need? 
The macro expert thinking of the body temple lays out the steps to build new legacies and improve upon the old, like improving systems. The body is also motivated by the macro duty of introverted sensing, where they carry the generational burden of building or destroying legacies. A procedure is legacy. This is why the body temple is a systematic temple, okay? Uh, you know, whereas like, you know, the heart temple is kind of more of a interest-based temple, if you think about it, which is also fascinating, very fascinating. So this is important. It's all about building and destroying legacies, but let's actually look at what legacy is. So anything handed down from the past, like a tradition, as from an ancestor or predecessor, or a gift of property, especially personal property as money by will or a bequest, Legacy is the continuation of the past to the present. It's also where our history is. The body temple is the arbiter of history. That's why history is often written by the victor. Napoleon, he was a member of the body temple. Everything he was doing is about his legacy. And he would literally rewrite the history of France for a while until he was ultimately defeated. Okay? That's what happens. That's why history is written by the victor. And it's literally an influence, a direct influence from the body temple itself. All right. So legacy is the continuation of the past to the present. And per the second definition it is the gift given to future generations. Though what is left behind is not always a gift. Not unlike, you know, Congress, the United States of America, that actually thinks that social security is a good thing. Those fools. Those idiots. Or maybe they're not so foolish. Maybe they're not so idiotic. Maybe... They're just intentionally trying to treat us like cattle every day. I look forward to people having a huge problem with them and taking it out on them physically, you know, like tarring and feathering people in the old days, something that needs to be brought back. That'd be a tradition the body temple should bring back. Within the body temple, legacy means continuing the traditions of the past, which is introverted sensing, built around the standards, rules, regulations, laws of extroverted thinking, that once led to success. Some examples include, uh, you know, Kobe Bryant, who was an ISFP mimicking his game after studying Michael Jordan, uh, Gordon Ramsay, who's an ENTJ spending years perfecting his culinary art. And then uh, Christopher Nolan, an ENTJ, who was inspired to make his own films after experiencing uh, Kubrick's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey and George Lucas's Star Wars. Oddly enough, George Lucas too is an ENTJ, all right? But legacy isn't just preserved, it's also created and refined. The essence of legacy then is not a passive act of preserving the remains of the dead. And, you know, like I said, tradition is a corpse of wisdom, like preserving those traditions, but it is an active motion forward. Many INTPs, for example, build the path for humanity through their inventions today. They discover the new standards, not unlike uh, Albert Einstein, whose theory of relativity was actually proven correct in uh, in uh, uh, the year of 2020. So, but the biggest danger for the body temple is to ultimately stagnate in the mere preservation of the past. The true legacy is built on by created new things from the inspiration of the old, which is creating new things, the outcome being introverted sensing from the inspiration of the old, the inspiration from expert intuition, right? of the old introverted sensing. It's an endless loop within this cognitive axis. The past can only serve us properly if pieces of it can be left behind. I've been doing a lot of research into ancient history. No, I don't believe the pyramids were built by the Egyptians at all. I think the pyramids predate the Egyptians. I also believe that uh, Egypt is ultimately a colony of Atlantis and that the Egyptian pantheon came from the Atlantis pantheon. I'm not sure if the Atlantis pantheon came from Babylon, though, or the other way around. Not entirely sure about that. There's some uh, Tower of Babel stuff there. But given that the flood predated the Tower of Babel, it probably did not come from Babylon. Probably more came from Atlantis and then Babylon later. So when you're studying the mystery, the ancient mystery Babylon religion, which is said to be the oldest religion in the world, I actually no longer agree with that. I don't think it is the oldest religion in the world. I think older still, that would be uh, 
it would probably be the Atlantis religion, especially since it's king, King Atlas, just happens to be the same Atlas mentioned in the Greek pantheon. So the point is, is that if you can't really leave something behind for future generations to enjoy or utilize or understand, the body temple has ultimately failed in its purpose. So what are the origins of legacy? So there are two origins that compose the uh, big origin of legacy. They are discovery and purpose. And remember, discovery plus purpose equals manifest destiny, okay? Discovery is pushing into a frontier and making the unknown known. It is invention and creation fueled by vision. It is producing, and yes, ESFJs reproducing counts too. Uh, funny, because like ESFJ women, for example, have the most children out of all the 16 types. Think about that. Um, purpose is a reason to live. It is a singular goal that leads to the pursuit of achievement and expression. ENTJs and ISFPs are looking for something so engaging that nothing can break their focus. Notice how these two origins work together. Discovery expands the borders for what purpose can be pursued. Discovery makes the sandbox bigger to play in. Discovery creates purpose just as Purpose inspires discovery. Again, folks, this is all about manifest destiny. The manifest destiny leading to legacy. But what about the uh, deadly sins and living virtues? The deadly sins of the body temple are gluttony and greed. Gluttony is the act of consuming in excess to compensate for a lack of exploration. If there's nothing to explore, then consuming helps to numb the boredom of stagnation. If there's nothing left to explore, I may as well just sit around and consume. And this is why the body temple out of all the 16 types are the most obese. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, part two of that is greed. Greed is hoarding and even stealing opportunities when not to, opportunities feel scarce. The less of something there appears to be, the harder generosity is. It's like, hey, I may not have another opportunity to take again, so I'm gonna take some extra. That's greed. Right. And then you can even and these people can even be generous and then become greedy as a result of their generosity. When they are generous to other people, then what they've given has strings attached because those people are still they are either greedy at that moment or they become greedy later. That's something to watch out for. There's also something heavily explored in our deadly sin of gluttony and greed lectures in the members area. Go to csjoseph.life forward slash members. And then uh, go ahead and check out that content there after you become a journeyman member. Look for season seven, part two. Uh, now, the living virtues, a little bit different. We have generativity and generosity. Generativity is using consumption to fuel creation. It is bringing something new into existence. It can be an invention, a piece of art, building a house, or even starting a family. Another thing about generativity is that it has the concept of producing more than you consume. Sometimes, uh, like this is actually where pr the idea of profit, personal profit actually comes from when you're running a business. You take a bunch of materials and ingredients, you put them together, you create something new, and you sell it for more than what the ingredients or the materials actually cost in order to, quote, make a profit, okay? That's what generativity is, producing more than you consume, right? Then there's generosity. Is providing opportunities to others through resources, time, knowledge, even when they feel like the walls are closing in on them. It is choosing to have an open hand and doing it without strings attached. This is giving for the sake of giving. And that's very important. Very, very important. So let's look at deadly sins uh, and living virtues as expressions of legacy. All right. So. Generativity and generosity are both forward-moving, open-handed pursuits in an attempt to build and share a legacy. Generating something new means moving with an open mind into the unknown and bringing something back. Generativity builds legacy through constructing it. So I actually was speaking to an INTP yesterday, and he was like, what do I do with my life? You know, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what's going on. And I gave him one. I built him an entire map to what his life should look like within this coaching session and basically gave him a future. And I told him, this is what you have to do. You have to do it this way. You're, fan you're like, you have no legacy. 
you're literally doing nothing more than teaching your children to go to school, get a uh, go to college, get a job, which means they're ultimately going to become losers. There's no entrepreneurship there. There's no health and fitness there. You yourself are, have, don't even have health and fitness. So I told this INTP to get out of his comfort zone because he's stagnating and move forward to get out of it. So generosity, likewise, is to live with an open hand, believing that opportunities will come to them when they provide opportunities for others, which is biblically true because there is the old biblical adage that says, give and it shall be given unto you. But remember, it's not truly giving if you're giving with strings attached. It's not truly giving if you're being transactional. You have to give with zero expectation of getting anything back for that. Zero expectation. The very essence of leaving behind a good legacy is literally an act of generosity. If you actually go out of your way to make sure that you leave a good legacy for your children, that is technically a form of generosity. It's also a form of being generative. You generated all of that inheritance for them to have, and then you're giving it to them. That's generativity and generosity all in one at the point of your death. The point of death ultimately is where the body temple is actually proven. Gluttony and greed are both stagnating, closed minded, or closed handed pursuits in an attempt to find and create a legacy. Gluttony gives the physiological experience of novelty. It is trying to find something worth pursuing and investing time and energy into. How is gluttony an expression of legacy? Gluttony influences what will be shared with posterity. Gluttony is used by INTPs and ESFJs to relate to others and for their posterity to carry on their taste. Gluttony is proof of what is valued enough to consume. This is why these people end up having relationships with people who have shared consumption. Oh, you like the same movies? You like the same kind of popcorn? It's like a big deal. And you know what's really interesting, folks? Like, I never actually thought ESFJs were gluttonous. I never thought that before we got into uh, what we're doing now with temple exploration. I never thought that. But I literally just saw my ESFJ sister for the first time in years on Saturday. And my God, she is one of the most obese women I have ever seen. And here I am. Last time she saw me, I was probably 200 pounds. And now I'm 153 pounds. And she's like, what is going on here? And I could tell it bothered her. Because for her entire life, I was actually fatter than her, but no longer, no longer. It makes me very, very sad. I hope the day comes where she actually asks me for help and advice on what to do. So again, gluttony is proof of what is valued enough by others to consume. Now, from a greed perspective, greed is a hyper focus on one's own pursuits, goals, accomplishments, and opportunities. Greed is also the outcome of a scarcity mindset. It is possible, it is impossible to be greedy if one lives in a psychological state of abundance. However, there are times when greed is necessary, either to filter out negative influence in one's life or to commit to a singular vision. Greed builds legacy through that singular vision, taking and using whatever it can along a way in order to guarantee the outcome of its accomplishment, right? This is no different than when uh, John Ferner who started off as an associate at Walmart and is now the CEO of Walmart, John Ferner. He is an ENTJ. He's part of the body temple. And yeah, many people say he was really greedy going about doing it. But now going to Walmart, Walmart had a bad rap for like for decades. But now they got Walmart Plus. They got self-checkout. They got a pickup and drop off. They have delivery. Uh, it's They have also the lowest fuel costs in all of the United States of America, they're doing, they're doing great. They're doing a lot better. It's a much better customer experience because out with the old, in with the new, the new procedures, the new customer experience with his singular vision of changing the reputation of Walmart and approving upon it, right? So the other temples, obviously, all the temples influence each of the other temples. And we're going to be talking about temple influence in this month's uh, Cutting Edge episode for Cutting Edge, September 2022. So 
The types within each temple need to understand that achieving the origin within their temple requires an integration of the other temples. The, the body temple sits in axis with the soul temple, which is the superego possession, orbit with the mind temple, which is the shadow position, and reflection with the heart temple, which is the subconscious position. To integrate the other temples, uh, types within the body temple need to implement uh, the four perspectives of each of the different temples. Starting with the soul temple perspective. Realize that the legacy they leave to their prosperity uh, directly affects the next generation's identity and values. They need to realize that like their legacy needs to factor in humanity. It's like uh, how ENTJs often will create procedures and ways of doing things while completely ignoring the fact that human beings are the ones that actually have to do it, which it's kind of soulless to a point. And that's ultimately leaves a bad legacy, right? So, they must leave an impactful legacy. Body temple types need to spend time investigating their own identity and their own values. Ultimately, works of art or achievements are motivating to the extent that a person understands who they are or is seeking to understand who they are. The pursuit of achievement while ignoring the soul leads to basically massacres in the name of a higher purpose, but it also leads to slavery. It leads to human trafficking, for example. Why do you think, like, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, you remember her? One of the worst human traffickers in human history? She's an ENTJ. Don't forget that. This is how she's completely uh, ignored the soul temple with the legacy of sex trafficking that she has left behind. Then there's the mind temple perspective. To leave a legacy requires one to be a student of the legacies they stand on. Education through the acquisition of skills, knowledge, equips the body temple types, with the tools to carve the impact that they want to leave on others. Knowledge is the prerequisite for effective action. Action without knowledge threatens the stability of legacy and undermines one ability to fulfill their purpose. But I would actually take this one step further. If you would consider history and the lessons from history, if you do not pay attention to history, if you do not understand the lessons of history, then you are doomed to repeat it. Just like that saying I use all the time from Battlestar Galactica, all that has happened before will happen again. The mind temple perspective and the mind temple influence upon the body temple is there to prevent that outcome. They just have to pay attention to it. They have to realize that it's their responsibility to make sure that they are not ignoring or being ignorant of history, even to the point of making sure they're keeping track of history. This is why so many archaeologists are from the body temple folks. And then there's the heart temple perspective. To be effective in inspiring others to help pursue one's vision requires one to inspire passion in them. Do you think Cortez was lackadaisical and complacent when inspiring his men to conquer the Aztecs? No, he burned, his bo he burned their boats and took their choice away, forced them to move forward. The pursuit of a goal must be properly fueled by desire. Otherwise, the purpose itself will not be enough. Purpose without passion is like pursuing something only because other people care about it, but you do not. Genuine purpose is confirmed and sustained through one's own passion. Again, John Ferner with Walmart. Here's another example of that, though. Like, for example, purpose without passion is like pursuing something only because other people care about it, but you do not. When did this happen in recent history with an ENTJ CEO? Oh, that's right. John Scully, when he completely screwed over Frank, uh, uh, Steve Jobs okay, at Apple and had Steve Jobs ousted. And this is the CEO of Apple that Steve Jobs hired because John Scully was not passionate about Apple. He did not care about it. It was other people's passion. It was Steve Jobs' passion, but it wasn't his passion. But then all of a sudden, Steve Jobs eventually got a different ENTJ named Tim Cook. And Tim Cook is very passionate about the legacy Steve Jobs left behind. I'll be getting a new iPhone in a week or two. That's how powerful that legacy is. Legacy is ultimately a neutral term. Legacy can set others up for success or failure. One can have a bad or good legacy, but leaving a legacy is ultimately inevitable. The clearest legacies that leave the most behind are given through the expression of multiple temples. Temple integration is one of our paths towards wholeness. 
but it's not just about being whole. It is every expression of what it is to be human. The entire human experience is ultimately determined and influenced by the temples. Everyone must understand that every temple influences the four sides of their mind as well as their own temple themselves, itself, literally. You must be aware of these things. And it's what this does is it ends up showing you a pathway from which you can grow yourself moving forward. And we're actually going to be discussing that a lot more when we go in deeper for octogram related, uh, uh, related content in the very near future. So stay tuned for that, folks. Anyway, um, that is it uh, for uh, this season 18 episode, The Body Temple. So anyway, folks, uh, thanks for watching and listening. And I'll see you guys tonight on the Discord. Later.